Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer on this Wednesday of Easter 7, May 28th, 2020. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter them, and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things, or who it is that gave you this authority. He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went to another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants, so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is from the Large Catechism, section 3, beginning at paragraph 1. This is the introduction to the Lord's Prayer. The introduction to the Lord's Prayer will take us tonight and tomorrow. And then each day we will do one petition. So we'll be in the Lord's Prayer for the next two weeks. Part 3. Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. We have now heard what we must do and believe in what things the best and happiest life consists. Now follows the third part, how we ought to pray. For we are in a situation where no person can perfectly keep the Ten Commandments, even though he has begun to believe. The devil, with all his power, together with the world and our own flesh, resists our efforts. Therefore, nothing is more necessary than that we should continually turn toward God's ear, call upon him, and pray to him. We must pray that he would give, preserve, and increase faith in us in the fulfillment of the Ten Commandments, 
2 Thessalonians 1, 3. We pray that he would remove everything that is in our way and that opposes us in these matters, so that we might know what and how to pray. Our Lord Christ has himself taught us both the way and the words, Luke 11, 1 to 4, as we shall see. But before we explain the Lord's Prayer, prayer part by part, it is most necessary first to encourage and stir people to prayer, as Christ and the apostles also have done, Matthew 6, 5 to 15. And the first thing to know is that it is our duty to pray because of God's commandments. For that's what we heard in the second commandment, you shall not take the name of your Lord your God in vain, Exodus 27. We are required to praise that holy name and call upon it in every need, or to pray. To call upon God's name is nothing other than to pray, 1 Kings 18.24. Prayer is just as strictly and seriously commanded as all other commandments, to have no other God, not to kill, not to steal, and so on. Let no one think that it makes no difference whether he prays or not. Common people, I think this, who grope in such delusion and ask, why should I pray? Who knows whether God heeds or will hear my prayer? If I do not pray, someone else will. And so they fall into the habit of never praying. They build a false argument as though we taught that there is no duty or need for prayer because we reject false and hypocritical prayers. Matthew 6, 5. But it is certainly true that the prayers that have been offered up till now, when men were babbling and bawling in the churches, Matthew 6, 7, were not prayers. Such outward matters of prayer, when they are properly done, may be a good exercise for young children, scholars, and simple persons. They may be called singing or reading, but not really praying. But praying, as the second commandment teaches, is to call upon God in every need. He requires this of us and has not left it to our choice. But it is our duty and obligation to pray, if we would be Christians, just as it is our duty and obligation to obey our parents and the government. For by calling upon God's name and praying, his name is honored and used well. This you must note above all things, so that you may silence and reject thoughts that would keep us and deter us from prayer. It would be useless for a son to say to his father, What good does my obedience do me? I will go and do what I can. It makes no difference. But there stands the commandment, You shall and must obey. So here prayer is not left to my will to do it or to leave it undone, but it shall and must be offered at the risk of God's wrath and displeasure. This point is to be understood and noted before everything else. Then by this point we may silence and cast away the thoughts that would keep us and deter us from praying, as though it does not matter if we do not pray, or as though prayer was commanded for those who are holier and in better favor with God than we are. Indeed, the human heart is by nature so hopeless that it always flees from God and imagines that he does not wish or desire our prayer because we are sinners and have earned nothing but wrath. Romans 4.15 Against such thoughts, I say, we should remember this commandment and turn to God so that we may not stir up his anger more by such disobedience. For by this commandment, God lets us plainly understand that he will not cast us away from him or chase us away. Romans 11.1 this is true even though we are sinners, but instead he draws us to himself, John 6, 44, so that we might humble ourselves before him, 1 Peter 5, 6, bewail this misery and plight of ours and pray for grace and help, Psalm 69, 13. Therefore, we read in the scriptures that he is also angry with those who were punished for their sin because they did not return to him and by their prayers turn away his wrath and seek his grace. Isaiah 55, 7. Now, from the fact that prayer is so solemnly commanded, you are to conclude and think that no one should in any way despise his prayer. Instead, he should count on prayer. He should always turn to an illustration from the other commandments. A child should in no way dis despise his obedience to father and mother, but should always think, this work is a work of obedience. What I do, I do for no other reason than I may walk in the obedience and commandment of God. On this obedience I can settle and stand firm, and I can value it as a great thing, not because of my worthiness, but because of the commandment. So there also we should think about the words we pray and the things we pray for as things demanded by God and done in obedience to Him. We should think, on my account this prayer would amount to nothing, but it shall succeed because God has commanded it. Therefore, everybody, no matter what he has to say in prayer, should always come before God in obedience to this commandment. 
We pray, therefore, and encourage everyone most diligently to take this counsel to heart and by no means to despise our prayer. For up to now it has been taught in the devil's name that no one should think about these things. People thought it was enough to have done the act of praying whether God would hear it or not. But that is staking prayer on a risk and murmuring it at a venture. Therefore it is a lost prayer. For we let thoughts like these lead us astray and stop us. I am not holy or worthy enough. If I were as godly and holy as St. Peter or St. Paul, then I would pray. But put such thoughts far away. For the same commandment that applied to St. Paul applies also to me. The second commandment is given as much on my account as on his account, so that Paul can boast about no better or holier commandment. You should say, My prayer is as precious, holy, and pleasing to God as that of St. Paul or of the most holy saints. This is the reason. I will gladly grant that Paul is personally more holy, but that's not because of the commandment. God does not consider prayer because of the person, but because of his word and obedience to it. For I rest my prayer on the same commandment on which all the saints rest their prayer. Furthermore, I pray for the same thing that they all pray for, and have always prayed. Besides, I have just as great a need of what I pray for as those gray saints, no, even greater one than they. That's where we'll end this evening, and we'll finish the conclusion tomorrow evening. We join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, true King of heaven and earth, you promised to your church that the gates of hell would not prevail against her, and you still cause your word to be preached and your holy sacraments to be administered among us. But, ah, O Lord, the sins of your people obscure the majesty of your bride. Your holy vineyard is trampled and your blessed sacrifice stands neglected. Many think themselves strong and despise the life-giving food that you have ordained for your people for the forgiveness of their sins. Pardon all our arrogance, and do not come to us in wrath to remove the lamp of your word from before our eyes. O Lord, we pray you, visit this vine which you once established for yourself, and renew us with the sun of your mercy and the water of eternal life. Give us a great hunger for the food of your true body and blood, and let all your faithful people ever be found in the Apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of your bread, and in the prayers. We implore you, O Lord, for our altar, that it may ever be a place where the medicine of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, strengthens us in body and soul, that disbelief and impenitence may stay far from all who come there, so that they may not eat and drink to their own judgment. O eternal High Priest, let the fruit of your Spirit grow in us, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and chastity. Cause us to live in holy conduct toward one another to the glory of your holy name, here in time and hereafter in eternity. For you live and reign with the Father in the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are the stone that the builders rejected, but on the third day you became the cornerstone. By your word and spirit, open our hearts to receive you as the beloved Son sent from the Father, so that we might always embrace suffering as the means by which we enter into your glory. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, your mercy attends us all our days. Be our strength and support amid the wearisome changes of this world, and at life's end grant us your promised rest and the full joys of your salvation. 
through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a blessed evening. Good night.